So let's move from from to a completely different part of the animal kingdom. Yep. Uh, and talk about gorilla. So the context here is that uh, I've used, and probably a lot of our listeners have used ChatGPT plugins, which mm-hmm. are a really cool way of interfacing it with real time information right. um, in ways that are um, designed to to be really smooth. And so mm-hmm. um, you can, if you're a ChatGPT Plus subscriber, you can go to the settings and you can choose to be involved in the beta for these plugins. And then you get this like plugin store. And so you can choose to Mathematica from the plugin store. And right. then when you provide some kind of math problem or equation related problem to ChatGPT, um, it should, instead of trying to use next token prediction, which is not a <laughs> mathematically right. sound way to be making predictions, though is unbelievably well in, in a surprising, mm-hmm. it does unbelievably well in a surprising number of circumstances. Mathematica, which is a language designed for doing math, should be better at solving that problem. So the, mm-hmm. the ChatGPT plugin should recognize, oh, here's some math, Mathematica would be better for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's lots of different kinds of applications out there, like real-time web search, or even very specific searches, like Kayak is one of the most popular plugins. So for booking um, a car or a hotel room or whatever, you could go into ChatGPT and say, I would like to go to Los Angeles, and can you rent me a car? And it'll come back with some suggestions, um, all right in there in the chat interface. So that's all really cool, but it's not open source. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, you and your colleagues at Berkeley, as well as, I guess, Microsoft Research, mm-hmm. have been working on an open source kind of variant of this. Yeah, so uh, it, it was the the Gorilla project uh, named because uh, gorillas use tools, uh, which was simple. Um, I've back named it to say uh, LLA, uh, Large Language APIs, um, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's a refinement of the original intention of the name. Uh, basically, gets this idea of you know how can an LLM interact with web services, with technologies outside of itself to gain knowledge uh, and to uh, affect the world. Um, and I think this is where a lot of this technology will head, uh, that these, these AIs will make it so that, uh, we interface not with the browser, but, you know, through, through text or through voice with an AI that interfaces with the web, uh, that they can find and, and use services to achieve tasks. Um, and this is kind of the bigger vision of the gorilla project. Uh, gorilla, uh, started, uh, I guess, uh, in the early early winter, um, it was a, it's a you know early yeah. So Grill started uh, as a discussion even before kind of Vicuña was taking off, um, and then as Vicuña took off, we were certainly pushing more in the kind of the you know, having better open source models. We were doing doing more stuff. Um, I think with the Grilla project today, uh, it's it's become uh, an open source effort to target a wide range of different APIs. Uh, the way it works is you ask Grilla, you know, I want to do. Uh, in fact, you have Gorilla for the, the terminal. So you can go in your terminal and you can install the Gorilla <laughs> command line tools and say, I want to list all my files in order of you know size and uh, followed by date. Um, and it'll tell you what commands to run to, to do that. Um, and the way this works, and, and I think this is kind of the exciting part of Gorilla uh, that maybe is a little different than what even OpenAI is doing, um, is we combine retrieval augmented generation, it's called RAG, uh, with fine tuning. Um, and, and the reason to do this is to make it so that the model can discover APIs. So we should be able to add new APIs um, by a documentation uh, to the model. Um, and then we fine tuned it to be able to read these APIs uh, to be more effective at reading these docs and then generating results uh, in a manner that you know, is consistent with the request. Um, remarkably, fine tuning is pretty critical. And one of the surprising findings for me in this work is that fine tuning on the APIs goes a very long way. Um, and that retrieval helps a little bit, a little bit more, um, but but uh, fine tuning the model to understand the API seems to be pretty critical. Um, and this creates uh, problems for the entire field. If the future is to be fine tuning models on your data, um, that means we're going to have a lot of very expensive to run models uh, to to be able to do a lot of things. Um, we should come back to you know what that means for kind of research and for industry. Uh, but for the Gorilla project. Uh, it's meant that we've had to find a lot of resources to host these models. We try to make them open to the world. You can download the models yourselves, but we also uh, host them in the cloud. Uh, and our hope as we push the project forward is to kind of further extend this idea of incorporating uh, retrieval with uh, fine tuning to be able to support not just calling a single API, but I should be able to you know, t- ch- chat to my computer. I need to book flights for my upcoming conference. And I can go look at my calendar and figure out, oh yeah, I think this conference is this. 
can figure out when I might want to be there. You know, there's a weekend, it's discounted, come back and say, well, the cheapest you know, flights for your you know, trip to VLDB would be the following. Um, and so I go, yeah, I like those. Can you book those flights and find hotels for me as well? And that kind of interaction with the chatbot uh, and then the chatbot taking action on the world uh, is, I think, where we're all headed with a lot of this technology. Yeah, it's not that much of a stretch anymore to imagine. Uh, well, well, so let me back up a second. And, and so, uh, a year ago, I gave a TEDx talk where I went through the life of this woman named Jean Calment. She was a French woman. She's the oldest person uh, to ever have lived, according to like documentation. And so she lived like 121 or 122 years. And so I, I follow her life from when she was born in the 1870s to when she died in the 1990s. And over that time span, is it like everything was invented, <laughs> like pretty much like it's like from light bulbs to transistors. I could go over the long list, but it's wild the changes that happened in the 120 years that she was alive. And so in my TEDx talk, I was like, well, now try to project forward from today and think about, you know, baby born today given medical advances and that lifespan doubled, average lifespan in the West doubled in Gene Calment's lifetime, maybe we're not going to be able to double, but it seems safe to say that some child born around today is going to live at least as long as her. And so what kinds of changes will this child bear witness to? And even in Gene Calment's lifetime, like the change was so rapid that there's no way that Gene, when she was a kid, would have been thinking about cell phones mm -hmm. and the internet. Um, and my argument that I make in the TED Talk is that because of AI in particular, and because we have more human brains than ever before that don't need to be doing physical labor for the most part, there's all of this human ingenuity combined with AI. Things are going faster than ever, and that's going to increase. It's going to increase right. and increase and increase. And so um, it was recently the one-year anniversary of me giving that talk. And so I reposted the talk, and I said, when I was giving this talk, if you had asked me if we would ever in our lifetimes have something with the capabilities yeah. of GPT-4, I would have said maybe. Yeah. And now we have it. Yep. And so it isn't a big stretch of the imagination at all. And in terms of technically, like it's kind of just a matter of gluing pieces together. There's no reason today why I couldn't have all of my email inbox history, all of my historical calendar events um, be processed by some kind of LLM like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some cleverness, like you're saying, like getting the API things right, but it could absolutely do that. Everything you just described of, you know, yep. based on my history of like the kinds of flights that I tend to pick, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're probably going to want to get there two days before the conference. Like you usually right. do because, uh, right. you know, and you mentioned three years ago, why in an yep. email <laughs> and it's got that right on cue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't. I, I can't remember where we were in the conversation, but <laughs> well, so uh, I think this kind of uh, rapid progress in AI—it's—it's uh, it's taken a lot of us, uh, even those of us doing the research, by surprise. Uh, you know, uh, a year ago, um, in fact, a year ago when I was working on my company, which maybe we'll come back to, um, mm -hmm. uh, we were seeing a lot of people using Scikit-Learn uh, and doing basic machine learning, uh, and I was kind of. Kind of sad, actually, because we had done all this really cool deep learning stuff uh, and built new systems to support it. But that was kind of, you know, a lot of scikit-learn and basic machine learning. And then, you know, fast forward to today and everyone's like, actually, I think I want to run uh, large language models. Uh, deep learning is now mainstream enough that, you know, the basic things that I would do, I, I should be doing with deep learning today. Um, so we've moved fast in the technology. We've moved fast in the adoption of the technology. I've heard story like, people's grandparents are using LLM to cheat on their book clubs. That's awesome. <laughs> but that's kind of, that's a big shift that, you know, a technology that's, uh, you know, is kind of deep in research is now, you know, so mainstream that it's, you know, it's in, you know, in, in, in discussions around contract negotiations with unions, it's shaping how, uh, you know, how people <laughs> cheat on their book clubs. Uh, this is a, a big shift in technology. Um, and AI has, you know, in the past, been a, a source of hype and a source of failure, um, I think we're at a point where the hype might have met uh, reality, um, or reality might even be exceeding the hype that we had. Um, and that's exciting. It's a little bit scary, too, uh, what it means for research, what it means for industry. Uh, it's harder and harder for me to know what tomorrow or what six months from now will look like. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
So yeah, so Gorilla, another step in this, mm-hmm. open sourcing this capability of having, I you, you can support an, like an effectively unlimited number of different kinds of APIs with this, right? And mm-hmm. um, so what's the, going back to kind of the nuts and bolts of this, uh, retrieval augmented generation um, rag, what would happen if Gorilla only had that? So if Gorilla didn't have the fine tuning to understand mm-hmm. an API and it just had rag, what would that right. look like? What would we be missing? Yeah, so we did some studies of this. Uh, I, I was keenly interested in, in kind of what is the you know the the best we could achieve with RAG um, using the Llama or Vicuña models. We didn't get very far, so we switched to Claude. Um, Claude is actually remarkably good at long contexts, um, and we can stuff a lot of documentation in that context. Yeah, and, and we did, can get. Did, did you see? Yeah. So just today, at the time of recording, <laughs> Anthropic announced that they have expanded the context window on Claude from nine thousand ish tokens to 100,000 tokens. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> yeah, this race for large context is exciting. Uh, yeah. We could talk about that. Yeah, in, yeah, in let's talk about too. that next, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, but just looking at Claude as our as our baseline, this is a pretty, you know, this is a good model with the long, long context support. Um, I think we might've had beta access some of the earlier larger context APIs. We stuck a lot of text in um, and we get pretty close to Gorilla uh, with just fine tuning. Um, and so fine tuning pushed grill a long way. Now there's some caveats and, and I, you know, I do this, I want to, this is research. So, uh, we were looking at a specific class of benchmarks that are focused on calling hugging face and PyTorch APIs, uh, because it has lots of documentation, lots of usage. Um, and so, uh, it's a smaller set of APIs. So we could perhaps be fine tuning effectively to memorize large fractions APIs, um, Regardless, that fine tuning again, even if it's memorizing the APIs, is making a big difference. Uh, and that was something that I was, I was again surprised about that that even with Claude, with good, uh, you know, uh, my students have become pretty good at prompt engineering. So you know, kind of hacking the inputs, uh, it's still not enough to get to you know where we were with fine tuning. Um, so yeah, I, it's an open discussion. I think where where RAG, where this retrieval augment generation and fine tuning uh, will come together, and I think you know. Uh, another point for me, uh, for the whole the whole podcast, I guess, is I, one of the big questions I think of 2024 and or maybe the end of 2023. I can't <laughs> see that far ahead. Uh, is kind of what is this balance of how we pu- how we will use RAG, uh, how we will s- essentially in context learning, stuffing examples, relevant data, um, how we'll mix that with fine tuning. Uh, and you know, there are a lot of reasons from the system perspective to push for something like RAG for you know using in context learning. Uh, but there also seems to be strong evidence that fine tuning can take models a long way. 